This morning's reading comes from Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. That is Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and he will put the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of, by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invited you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you are cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of one of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. As we've been looking at the Apostles' Creed um, together, we've thought about our Lord's first um, coming um, a few weeks back. And this evening we're thinking about um, his um, second coming, his re return. And these two comings of our Lord Jesus couldn't be more different. Uh, Jesus came the first time wrapped in uh, swaddling clothes. The second time he'll come wrapped in the glory of heaven. The first time he was laid uh, in a feeding trough. The second time he'll be seated um, on um, a judgment throne. The first time he uh, arrived in uh, obscurity, the second time it will be open for the whole world um, to see. Um, in our um, time, there's a lot of talk about equality and, and justice. And what the future holds is a day of reckoning um, for the whole earth and all its inhabitants. Justice will finally be done as Jesus Christ sits on his at judgment seat. So how do we live confidently and courageously in a broken world where all its problems and inequality and injustice is so evident by looking to the one who is seated on his throne and knowing that all will stand before his judgment seat to give an answer for what they have done in the body. So let's pray um, together. Lord, we pray that as we receive from your word, 
that that future reality of your return as judge <coughs> will give us clear focus in the present. Help us to live each day knowing that there is a day of reckoning for all people. Fill us, your people, with a reverent fear that causes us to pursue a holy life that is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Turn to Matthew 5, and you'll see from the handout that you've um, got there that we'll be flicking backwards and forwards between Matthew and 1 Thessalonians. Um, hopefully the handout will help you keep up. I've got quite a day, haven't I, really? Really, this morning I had slaves to sin and children of the devil, and this evening I've got, uh, he will come again as um, the judge of the living um, and the dead. And the others have gone on holiday, probably planned well. Um, at the church I attended as a, a teenager, there was a lovely um, old um, lady, Kath. I was in a Bible study, a real inspiring um, lady. And towards the end of her life, she was confined to her bed, very little uh, movement, um, couldn't get uh, about. But one day she heard a loud trumpet blast uh, and marching, and she, she mustered every little bit of energy that she had to prop herself up so that she could look out of the window, because she was absolutely convinced that it was the Lord's return. And she later recalled, unfortunately, it was just the local Salvation Army um, band. She, she genuinely, honestly, I was so inspired by this lady, she genuinely lived each day conscious and watchful for Christ's return. She was convinced that he was coming back. Now, for most people, the idea of Jesus' return and a final judgment just seems like pure fantasy, uh, something uh, from films or, or books. Maybe you chat to people like that, or maybe you yourself actually think, well, it's just a little bit far-fetched, isn't it? Is that really going to be how all things um, end? Let me paint you a scenario. Imagine, uh, imagine a country where every judge's seat was vacated, and every prison door was flung wide open. Is that the kind of world you would want to live in, and would you find it desirable, or would you have any problems with it? Let me paint another scenario. Imagine a universe where God has vacated that final judgment seat, and the gates of hell have been flung wide open. Is that a desirable um, universe? It would appear to me that God has embedded in the universe His justice, and that has also embedded itself in our hearts so that we cry out for justice now, we expect justice, precisely because, you remember last week when I was talking about the connection between heaven and earth, precisely because we know there is ultimate justice. We know there is a day of reckoning so I believe that longing and expectation transcend beyond just the earthly to a heavenly reality. The Bible is very clear. It says that God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. That is the section of the creed that we're going to think about together this evening. He will return as the judge of the living and the dead. So firstly, um, he. It may seem <clears throat> strange to start with one word um, from the creed, but this is vitally important because when we say he will return, we are talking about the personal return of Jesus Christ, and that matters. The same Jesus who was born in Bethlehem will come again. The same Jesus who walked the streets of Nazareth will come again. The same Jesus who turned water into wine in Canaan will come again. The same Jesus who walked on water 
on the Sea of Galilee will come again. The same Jesus who rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday will one day ride out of heaven in final judgment. We're talking about the personal return of Jesus Christ. The man Jesus Christ, remember last week, who has ascended to the right hand of the Father. It is He who will come again. It is our Lord and Savior who will ride out in judgment. Do you know why that matters? Isn't that not a huge comfort to you? It is He, He who you have come to place your faith in, the Savior, the King, He who walked with the people, who will come back to judge. Secondly, He will come again. Come again obviously reminds us that He's been um, before, but His second coming will be different to His first. In His first coming, He came in a state of humiliation, didn't he? But at his second coming, he will come in a state of exaltation. His coming again will be very um, different. His second coming will be visible, like clear for all to see. It, it so, talks in Matthew about being like lightning across um, the sky. You remember his first coming when we looked about the born of the Virgin Mary, how he was born in obscurity in some small town, hidden away. At his second coming, it will be obvious, obvious to all in a big way. No one will be able to escape it. It will be on full display. Nobody's going to miss it. How many times have you you read in the papers that someone have, has claimed that Jesus has come again and is in Texas or is somewhere in the Middle East, isn't it? All the time. Christians should never fall for you. Anybody who's read any of the Bible should never fall for that. You're not going to miss it. It's going to be visible for all to see. And his coming will be sudden. Cannot be calculated, just like a thief in the night. Uh, if you're a, a landlord and you want to enter your property... Uh, you're legally obliged to give the tenant 48 hours notice. Why? Well, so they can get things ship shape. <laughs> Pretend that it's all kept tidy and there's nothing broken and you know, strategically play some loo rolls over the broken um, toilet system or whatever it is that they do. Not that my tenants have ever done theirs. <laughs> Jesus' return will be sudden. No time for this quick turnaround. It's everything all quick shape up is on his way. That it will be visible for all to see and it will be sudden, like a thief in the night. But also, we're told in Matthew verse 31 that it will be in glory, shining in resplendent majesty like the rising of the sun. When Jesus comes again. Nobody will mistake where he's come from. For those of you who remember, this morning, remember in John 8, there's all this chat about where have you come from? Where have you come from? Nobody's going to ask at the second coming, where have you come from? Because he's going to come in glory. He's going to come in the splendor of heaven. It will be literally blindingly obvious to everybody where he's come from. In his first coming, he came wrapped in swaddling clothes. In his second coming, he's going to come wrapped in glory. And there's going to be no questions about, oh, where is this guy from? For the glory of heaven will descend with him for all to see. He will come again to judge. That's his appointed role. Look again at verses 31 and 32. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will gather before Him and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Jesus is saying, look, when I come again, I'm coming as judge. Judge of all the nations. The first time I came, I came to save I came to rescue, I came to redeem. But when I come again, it's not with an opportunity for people to be saved, rescued, or redeemed. I'm coming as judge. The final 
judgment will demonstrate unmistakably the justice of God. He said, I'm coming to make all things right. Justice will reign when Jesus returns. And he's appointed judge of the living and the dead. No one can escape the judgment. The Bible is absolutely clear, page after page, that all human beings who have ever lived will gather before the throne of judgment. All nations, that's how it's described in Matthew 25, will gather before him. He is the universal judge of all mankind. The Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a, a beautiful summary of Christian belief, here's how they state, what they state about the final judgment. Quote, God has appointed a day wherein he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ, to whom all power and judgment is given of the Father, in which day not only the fallen angels shall be judged, but likewise all persons that have ever lived upon the earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ to give an account of their thoughts, words, and deeds, and to receive according to what they have done in the body, whether good or evil. What will happen at the judgment? According to Matthew, there will be separation. The sheep and the goats will be separated. The whole world will be divided into two um, groups. There won't be dozens of tick um, boxes to see how you will define yourself on that um, day. And do you know like when the census comes around, you know, male, female, age, you know, um, Anglican, Baptist, whatever they might be, there'll just be two, sheep or goat. When people boarded the Titanic, the passenger list had various categories of people. But do you know when in New York, when they were trying to work out the passengers, do you know how many categories were on the list? Two. Lost, saved. That was it. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. It's not going to be tick boxes about color of skin, country of birth, social or marital status. We're going to either be the righteous or the wicked, sheep or God. And Jesus will make the division. He will make that separation based on faith, based on trust in Him. So how do we respond? Be His. Be His. Make sure you are one of the sheep. Come to trust in the good shepherd. Receive his salvation. Separate yourself now from the guts by following Jesus. Grace Wesley, some of you will have seen this film, God's Not Dead 2. She said, I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. Do you know what I love about that quote? Just, just a summary of Matthew 25. <laughs> They're the options for you. Stand with the world and be judged by God. Or stand with God and be judged by the world. But also at this judgment, there will be scrutiny. At that final judgment, when we stand before Jesus, every deed a person has performed, every word they have spoken, every thought that they've conceived, every motive that has driven them will be laid and bare before the judgment seat. Does that scare you? It scares me a little. But the more I think about it, the more I read um, within the context of the passages, um, sentiment and statements like that, I'm not sure that it was meant to strike fear into us. Let me explain why. I've known a number of people who work in the prison service, and do you know what they've all told me about most of the inmates? They're all innocent. It's just miscarriages of justice. 
evidence that wasn't right, witnesses that couldn't be brought forward. Let me tell you, after the final judgment is over, when all hearts have been opened before the judge, no one, absolutely no one, will be able to talk about a miscarriage of justice. Because when Jesus speaks about someone's life, their thoughts, their words, their deeds, their motives being laid bare, what he's saying is, look, my justice will be open and visible for all to see. Nothing is left unturned. Nothing is left un unexamined. No evidence is kept in the dark. No witness is left out. It's all here. I have absolutely everything necessary to make a perfect, just judgment call on every single individual. So there'll be no crocodile tears in the dock because everybody will get what is coming to them according to the perfect justice of God. So how do we respond? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us, be holy. We are children of the light, therefore we should scrutinize our thoughts, our words, our deeds. We should bring them into the light of God's word. We should make ourselves ready to come before the judge, not by putting on a suit. Isn't that what people um, do? I have, I've, been, I've had to go to a court for a few times. It's always strange when you see that person in the suit, isn't it? You, they're never in a suit. But someone said to them, put a suit on. Might impress the jury. Might impress the judge. Just get a suit on. That'll cover up what you've done wrong, won't it? <laughs> Your iniquity. No, that's not what we're to do. We're to make ourselves ready through repentance and faith, through putting off the old self with its practice, through clothing ourselves in the righteousness of Christ and living our, letting our, uh, living our lives shaped by, encompassed by His values so that we clothe ourselves in the righteousness of Christ and start to live the righteousness of Christ. Be holy. We need to scrutinize ourselves to make sure that all that we do flows from faith, not fakeness. Did you notice in Matthew 25, it's very clear that knowing I'm going to stand before Jesus as judge radically alters the way I stand before people. Right, I'm going to hit the pause button here. Um, pausing, those are on tech. When you read Matthew 25, let me, let me tell you something. In our congregation, not so much in the evening one now, but in the morning one, but in our congregations, there are lots of people who I think would be regarded as the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. Now, notice that's the first thing. It's not saying whatever you did for anyone. Jesus is not saying that here. Jesus is very clear. It's, he says, it's what you did for your fellow Christian. But he says it's what you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. Now, does that not trouble you, <laughs> given that most of us stay in our own groups and the least of our brothers and sisters are some of the refugees who've come from other countries and neglected amongst us on a Sunday morning. Because people don't chat to them, people don't befriend them, people don't have them in their homes. Does it not trouble you? Well, yeah, well, read Matthew 25, <laughs> it ought to trouble you. What you do for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. You better scrutinize your actions. You know, you better scrutinize your motives. You better scrutinize your words. You better scrutinize your deeds. Because Jesus is going to scrutinize them. Jesus at the judgment is looking for his sheep. And he, he said, actually, my sheep are quite obvious. They're recognizable because they're always serving one another, loving one another, doing things for one another. Their faith is uh, evident in the way that they practice their belief because they model themselves on me. They do the kind of things that I did. <laughs> Do you understand? So the shepherd is there, the Savior. He's sitting on his throne of judgment, and he looks out and is ready to separate the sheep from the goats. And he basically says, I know that's one of my sheep because he looks like me. 
He does the kind of things I did. He shows compassion to the lowly. He looks after the poor. He puts himself out for others. At the final judgment, there'll be sentencing. There's a separation between the sheep and the goats, between the righteous and the wicked. And this separation is based on the righteous scrutiny of people's lives, right down, right down to motives, and then is followed by sentencing that no one can disagree with. To those on the right, his sheep, they'll be invited into his Father's eternal kingdom. That's the sentence pronounced on them. To those on his left, the goats, they will be sent away to eternal punishment, verse 46. That is the sentence passed on them. But you notice it's also appropriate, isn't it? It coordinates with our choices, with our lives. This separation is not based on a whim. It's based on actual lives lived in response to Jesus as king. And the king has ascended, remember, up from the grave, up into heaven, up onto his throne. And then he's going to come as judge. And if you've said, well, actually, your kingship is not for me, what do you think is going to happen when the king's throne becomes the judgment throne? So how do we respond, knowing that there will be this sentencing? Well, actually, as Christians, we should be confident and courageous. In 1 Thessalonians 5, after talking about the final judgment, Paul writes in verse 11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. We should be confident and courageous in living the Christian life, confident and courageous in serving. I said to someone this morning, I'll just um, share it with you. They asked, they asked me a, a question, and they were talking about living the Christian life and what you do. And I said, when my non-Christian friend is spending so much money on a car or going, taking his whole family to Florida. And he says, oh, why don't you take your family to Florida? Do you know what? It doesn't bother me in the slightest. Do you know, I've never been troubled by that. I'm not troubled by an unbeliever and how they spend their money. And it's never made me think, oh, no, maybe I should do this or do that. Now, what troubles me is when fellow brothers and sisters when they're doing things radically different, when they're doing things like my non-Christian friends, and I think, what is it all about? <laughs> why am I making all these sacrifices? Do you know what I mean by what tr it troubles me? Why, I think, why am I making these sacrifices? Why don't I take more of my time for myself? Why don't I take more of my money for myself? Why don't I take more things for myself? But it doesn't bother me when non-Christians are doing that because that's what they should do. But when Christians are doing that, it troubles me and I think, have I got it right? And of course, I read Matthew 25 and I think, yeah, I've got it right. You see, at the final judgment, my friends, it really does matter what you have done. It really does matter what you have done with your money and your time your resources, it counts into eternity what you've used it for. Someone once said to John Wesley, if Christ were to come back tomorrow and you knew he would, what would you do today? And John Wesley said, I do what I'd planned to do. I do what I'd planned to do. John Wesley was already planning and living and serving, knowing that Jesus was going to return as judge. So he said, I wouldn't change anything. I'd just get on with what I'd planned to do. If it happened to take place that day, then he would be found doing what he should be doing. But let me ask you, if you knew that Jesus was returning tomorrow, would you be more like the tenants in the landlord's house who'd been served notice? Better brush up. 
See, knowing that Jesus is returning as judge of the living and the dead ought not to send Christians into crisis mode. Oh, better shape up before we stand before the judge. Rather, knowing Jesus is returning as judge should always put us in Christ mode. Better live up to the one whom we stand in. Do you understand? Most people, I think even most Christians, shamefully, we, we view the second coming in a crisis mode. If I knew when it was coming, I'd definitely shape up and alter things before I stand before him. But the reality is, as a Christian, you already stand in him. So be like him, the one you're going to stand before. We want to take every thought, every word, every deed, bring it before Jesus and say, look, it's all for you. Let's pass that sentence on our own lives. Let that be the sentence we pass on our own lives. Here and now that we say, look, Jesus, it's all for you. Knowing that when we stand before him on the judgment seat, he'll say, yes, because you were all mine. Now go to the right and stand there with the sheep. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this truth. And we recognize, Lord, and confess that it doesn't press upon our lives like it ought to. It's a deep truth. It's a truth that governs the universe. It's the end of all history where everything is heading. And that yet, Lord, we confess that we've made it so shallow. And so its impact upon our lives is so superficial. Have mercy upon us, Lord, and reorder our thoughts and our hearts in line with this truth that our Lord and Savior is returning as judge. And through faith in him, though we do not fear being found guilty, for he's taken the penalty of our sin, we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, with your strength, we pass the sentence on our lives that says it's all for you. May it be found that way on Judgment Day. Amen.